is actually the digital publishing track today, not the short term track. So, just a small correction there. I'll be making fun of Dave later on my presentation, so I'll get my revenge. Today, we're going to be talking about digital publishing and uh, across out ELE, because that's old. Uh, the, the new term, or the new buzzword that's going around is NGDLE, which stands for Next Generation Digital Learning, digital learning out of something. Um, but it's very popular right now, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Brian Willenbeck will be here around 11, hopefully, to give his talk on web components, which is, uh, I've heard him talk about it a thousand times, so it's super boring to me, but I'm sure everyone else will be really excited about it. Um, Doug's going to be taking us in the metaverse with, with his virtual reality talk, so I highly recommend sticking around for that. Um, Dave's going to be talking about uh, some creepy things that he does with Alexa. <laughs> and Paul Hibbets will be joining us from Vancouver via Zoom to talk about some open source content management system type stuff that he does with his courses. And uh, I have no idea what we're doing at 3.30. It says group work, so I assume someone has a plan for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. We started coming. yesterday, <laughs> and we have groups, and they're working very hard. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, not only am I the track chair, but I'm also a keynote speaker, so I'd like to introduce myself <laughs> to everyone. Michael Collins, an assistant professor, uh, part of Penn State uh, University, work at main campus, and uh, I've been teaching new media uh, and design for quite a few years now. And uh, some things that we will be discussing. Today include facts, well, all facts about what publishing is, forward thinking projects, and the interoperable future. Just kind of some uppercase issues there on this side. Okay, so to kick it off, we're going to do a brief and very incomplete history of publishing. Um, I made up a definition because I didn't like the ones on the internet. Uh, so it's the dissemination of information using a common language that can be later recalled by another. I can't really recall it at a later time. I haven't really published it. For a person to know something, information has to be first organized uh, and then recorded. And published knowledge can be recalled later from the medium on which it's recorded, right? So to have publishing, you need to have the medium with which on to publish. Okay, so for the invention of writing, stories were told around. Yeah, I'm gonna have to restart the story. Okay. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> Start again. For the invention of writing. Stories were told around the campfire and relied on auditory format to transmit knowledge from one person's brain to another. The recording medium was the human brain, right? So you would say a bunch of things that you wanted everyone to know, and then they would record it in a limbic system somewhere, and then later on they would retrieve it. And then that's how we sort of remember things. Uh, at a certain point, we kind of ran out of space. Um, to remember complex things, um, the amount of animals you had to trade, for instance, started getting really complicated to keep track of. So around 10,000 years ago, um, the ancient goat herders in the Zagros Mountains started making these clay tokens where they would make markings uh, to sort of remember um, sort of numbers for trade. And uh, that was kind of the start of where writing came from. Um, but it wasn't until Johannes, or Johannes Gutenberg was told the wrong year for a trade fair. So he had this, he's a very entrepreneurial, he was a very entrepreneurial person. So he had this idea to make a bunch of mirrors to sell to pilgrims that were going to be coming to his trade fair. 
And um, so he got a bunch of investors, and so they were gonna make these mirrors, and then he realized that he was given the wrong year, and so that plan wasn't gonna work out. So he pivoted and came up with a pretty press, as you would, and uh, so as I wrote, he accidentally disrupted the monolithic governance of the Catholic Church by triggering DIY local governance. Uh, so it turns out if you can give a town their own Bible, they start to think they have their own identity, and the Catholic Church starts to lose uh, the influence it thought it had over the surrounding communities. <coughs> Interestingly, um, Korea had um, printing presses 200 years before Europe, um, but they were smart enough to destroy the printing presses or not give them to everyone. Um, but they used it for the same purpose to reproduce religious texts. Um, so I think the Yi dynasty knew that if you gave everyone a printing press, that would be sort of like giving them all power to govern themselves. Um, so, oops. By 1500, there were 20 million printed books. And fast forward to the 80s, personal computers. Fast forward to the 90s, the internet. Uh, disruption of book publishing industries followed. Um, now everyone can self-publish constantly, all the time. Someone might be doing it right now. Let's see, at least one person, I'm assuming. Timo? Is that Timo. Timo? What are you doing? Are you publishing? <laughs> no, Timo's publishing. All right, perfect. Exactly. Uh, OK, so each instance of disruption happened when a common class person gained access to knowledge and publishing technology. So I want to talk about the recent knowledge journey that I embarked on. Um, I wanted to see the kinds of things that people publish on the internet when they're given uh, socially disruptive uh, technology, technology that can change the world. So I typed into Google how to fix, and I recommend everyone does this sometime. It's pretty wonderful. So I want to point your attention to number five on the list, how to fix hard slime. Um, I don't know about you, but that was baffling to me. I had no idea what uh, slime is. So I went on a learning journey figure it out. It turns out uh, it's polyvinyl alcohol and some borate ions. You put it in a bowl and then you mix them and then you get slime. The problem is it gets hard. Don't worry. 163,000 people have published the method for fixing your hard slime. And number two uh, on this list uh, has had over 2.7 million views. So <clears throat> One out of every 3,500 people in the world has watched this video, which means at least one Altoona student has learned how to fix their heart slime in the last three months. Yeah. So that's a good segue into virtual learning environments. Let's get into that. Uh, so humans have had access to publish and recall massive stores of knowledge thanks to the internet, as we all know. Uh, what about pedagogy? Do we get access to that? Do we want access to that? So the VLE, which, um, does anyone know or not know what VLE is? It's uh, the same as an LMS, which is kind of the same as a CMS, but people say it's not. Um, but anyway, it was, it was brought about to control learning uh, online when you're sort of at a distance. Um, so it's sort of the, the mechanism by which you can deliver pedagogy. Um, so the logical thing to sort of jump to would be, all right, so if we can store things on the internet, uh, like videos on how to fix slime, uh, you can also store things like pedagogy, um, and everyone will want to use it, um, but apparently not everyone will want to use it, so that, that's a bit of a misnomer. So I found this article, um, it's called Why Secondary Teachers Don't Want to, or Don't Want to Get Home for Lesson Plans. And um, some of the quotes here read as follows. I don't require a script, just decent ideas now and then. That's totally different. Uh, so I'm not sure they solve for the problems they think they're trying to solve for. It takes time to read, internalize, modify others' plans. And uh, David Wees writes, it's challenging to sequence, connect, plan, 
and enact someone else's lesson. And then uh, Mark sort of has the spark of insight at the end here. The plan itself is the least important element. The planning is what's critical. So um, from that, I've boiled those down into some insights. So the challenge is not centered on access to pedagogy. It's about access to creative tools and ideas. So how can we easily produce a remix of pedagogy? And this is at the core of the NGDLE, I think. So <laughs> it's uh, very important. And so the VLE asked, what if we could teach courses on the internet? Uh, MOOCs asked, what if what would happen if everyone had access to courses? And then the NGDLE is asking, what if we could spy on them? Don't believe me? Okay, according to the Educause Learning Initiative report published in April 2015, there are five dimensions for the NGDLE to be an NGDLE. Uh, the first is interoperability and integration, which we'll get into actually sort of, uh, for the rest of the day. The second is personalization. And the third is analytics, advising, and learning assessment. Uh, so I crossed it out about spy tools, as it's easier to say. And four, collaboration. And five, accessibility and universal design. And I sort of broke down different technologies into these uh, four boxes to try to figure out how to um, get to an NGDLE, what tools will take us forward in that direction. Um, so on the bottom left, we have um, a one axis old publication model, and then old power values is on the other axis. Uh, and then that's sort of um, the antithesis, right, new power values and then new publication model. Um, so on the bottom left we've got McGraw Hill, Desire to Learn, Pearson, Blackboard. So those are the closed source proprietary for pay, closed access um, businesses and products. And then so straight up above we have new publication models but old, old power values. Um, and I'll get into what the power values are in a minute. But we have things like Schoology, Twitter, Facebook, Slack, Trello, Google Media, Pressbooks, right? Open access, closed source. Um, standard sort of business models. And then um, bottom right, things like OpenStax, Moodle, Canvas, Sakai, X, right? open source, um, but maybe old publication models. And then on the top right, we have what I think might be the NGDLE components to take us sort of forward in that direction. Um, so things like GitHub, Gitbook, um, Elms Learning Network, which we'll learn more about today. Um, Grav, which you'll learn more about today. Um, the Pressbooks plugin for WordPress. Um, OER Pub, which uh, may or may not still be an active project. And then something called Suki, which uh, Dr. Chuck made. If you don't know who Dr. Chuck is, check him out on Twitter. Uh, he's an interesting guy. But basically, Suki uh, hacks itself sort of into all the other LMSs to deliver the technology he wants to deliver. <coughs> um, so, all those things are open source, open access, connected, distributed uh, projects. And then XAPI, which is uh, something that uh, Dave Fosco might talk about later today in his talk. OK, so old power values, new power values. Let's talk about that for a second. So old power values, uh, think of, well, I won't name any companies, but you probably know what they are. Uh, so managerialism, institutionalism, representative governance, versus sort of the new version of that, which is informal opt-in decision-making self-organization network governance. Right, so it's sort of self-governing. Um, exclusivity is an old power value, competition, authority, resource consolidation, versus open source collaboration, crowd wisdom, sharing. Um, old power values, discretion, confidentiality, separation. New power values, radical transparency, right? So. Um, it's something I sort of try to practice. It's really hard to be radically transparent. You don't want to show everyone everything all the time, um, even though it says to on the new power values chart. Um, so on the left, we've got professionalization, specialization, and on the right, do it yourselves, make a culture. Right. So these are are sort of contrasting power values, and um, this sort of helps us map things into categories. I put together a, an equation here um, for what the NGDLE uh, should be like. So if you take something that has 
power values and also has new publishing models. Um, that's what I think an engine DLE is. So that's your big takeaway for today. Okay, so let's start talking about some of the projects that people are working on. This is not a, a kind of complete list, but it's some projects that I'm personally familiar with, so it's a little bit easier to talk about a few of them. Uh, Born in the Middle is not a technology, it's a program I'm working on at Penn State, the Digital Multimedia Design Program, and it's an online bachelor's program, it's interdisciplinary, it's totally online through World Campus. Uh, take three college courses from three colleges and allow students to navigate their own uh, learning pathway through those colleges. Um, and then we've got some spine courses where they can synthesize everything they're working on in courses that are focused on things like design thinking um, and studio design projects. And so that's what I've been working on for the last two years. And the interesting thing about working on a project like that is all the side projects that can come out of it. So um, through working on that project, I discovered Gitbook, which I'll show a little bit later. Gitbook is a sophisticated authoring interface that sort of sits on top of Git version control technology, which is super cool. Um, you can also layer in schema, and I uh, worked on another project called OER Schema, which I'll talk about as well. And basically, OER Schema lets you tag things, uh, so like digital, um, I don't want to call them digital artifacts, but so text, right? Um, text isn't always just text, right? It might be an activity, it might be a description for a lesson, right? So the text has some connotation and some context, and it's really hard to describe that to software. So what we're seeing is really about tagging. Um, other projects that come out of this, we're building this thing called Program Hub, which is supposed to be sort of an identity and community space for the program. How do you make students who are sort of distributed all over the country and possibly the world feel like they're a part of a program and not just taking a series of courses um, that aren't related? And so we also have to figure out a online portfolios at some point. So that's sort of the next project to tackle. Um, and then in uh, the courses I developed, we use something called Elms Learning Network, which uh, if you're interested in that, it's on elmsln.org, which uh, Brian well, who will be here later will argue that that's an NGDLE, although he has different words that fit into the acronym. He doesn't call it the same thing. Um, okay. So I mentioned this uh, thing before called the interoperable future. What does that mean? Okay. Um, how do we get to the future where we are right now? I've written three easy steps that if you follow, We'll get us there. Step one, make everything open to education resources. Step two, give teaching tools to everyone. And step three is uh, hashtag robots. So we get into. Uh, so step one, OER. And I'm sure most of you have heard of OER. If you haven't, open educational resources um, are essentially any digital resource that is licensed for reuse and remix, right? So it's a lack of Creative Commons license on there. Um, CCC, how many C's was that? CCBY 4.0 uh, is sort of a typical Creative Commons license um, that I use. The less restrictive, the better, typically. We want people to use it. Um, so OER without open licensing is just ER, which is not helpful for getting to the future. Okay, so. What's the challenge? Why is everyone already using open education resources? Um, and that's because the people producing learning content face a lot of confusing unknowns, questions they have to answer. So things like, what tools should I use? Which license is the best option for me? Who owns the intellectual property? Am I allowed to do this at my university? How do I get permission? Is this OER outdated? Does this affect my tenure promotion? Will I be irrelevant after everyone has my slides? Right, so these are real concerns by faculty. <clears throat> and unfortunately, right now, the focus on OER uh, sort of popularly has been, oh, it saves textbook costs, which is only interesting if you care about taking money away from Pearson and McGraw-Hill. Uh, who doesn't? But 
Uh, I think it can be more than just reducing textbook costs. Okay, so there's already a ton of OER out there. Websites like OER Commons is uh, a one really good source that doesn't have everything out there. If you work in a content area and you're writing a course, um, you should do OER and then you know maybe think about um, submitting it to OER Commons and then other people can sort of easily find it and access to it. Um, <clears throat> all right, so even though I just asked you to do that, there's a big however. Using an authoring OER is really hard uh, for courses. Um, to do it right now, you kind of have to be a web developer or have a lot of technical skill. So there's no really easy tool out there to do OER just yet. Um, or at least to do it in an interoperable, remixable way. And another challenge is there's no real standards for OER, right? So um, someone might do a Google Doc and it would be formatted differently, and someone might do a Word document, someone might do, I don't know, a, a text document, does anyone do text and TXT? No one does those files, but you could do that as well. Um, images, uh, videos, and uh, all sorts of different formats, um, different pedagogical structures, different naming conventions. It's all very confusing. So how do you actually take two things and then put them together into uh, one thing, which is kind of what Remix is about? Um, so I have to hand it to those secondary education uh, pedagogy curmudgeons. They were right. This is hard, and it takes a lot of time. So to solve it, we need interoperability. The problem with OER interoperability is the chicken and egg problem, where we need remix tools. But before we can get the remix tools, we need OER that's interoperable, because then they won't know how to build remix tools, right? So these are conversations we keep having. Um, this is the same slide as the last one, but it has the best graphic design in the whole presentation, and I couldn't delete it. Okay, so I have a solution for this interoperability thing. I'm going to get there, but before we get there, let's talk about Remix for a second. So <clears throat> just a little bit of history. Remix is the process of combining and editing existing work to create derivatives. Music, sampling, and the hip-hop genre is the most obvious example. Um, though all creative endeavors include Remix to some degree, Creative Commons licensing allows authors to express their permission to allow derivatives. Um, and, and that, um, let me go back. So, yeah, that's what Remix is, but it, it's sort of happening all the time. Everything we do is sort of Remix. We are our, ourselves as people, a, a bit of uh, a Remix of everything we've interacted with. Um, so it's sort of a specific thing, and it's sort of everything. Um, so, I mentioned OER Pub earlier, and um, I put together this schematic of how it works. You take all those files that I mentioned before that are, are not compatible, and you put them in this machine, and you turn the crank, and then a remixable gets extruded out of the other side. Um, and I tried to use it yesterday, and this is what I got. So, I wasn't able to remix anything. Um, not to... Um, sort of down top of the hard work which they put in that software, but it's just not quite working. Um, so maybe that's not the right solution. Okay, so I mentioned the second step here to get into the future of the NGDLE, right? The second step is, as I claim, giving teaching tools to everyone. So another project I want to highlight is Elm's Learning Network. And I'm not going to go too much into this because Brian will be here to just talk it in the ground. But um, I highlighted some of the ways in which it is an NGDLE. It may be somewhere, uh, some ways that it's failing to be an NGDLE. So one way, uh, or criteria one, interoperability integration. Personalization tools are coming from that, but it's not there yet, so it doesn't quite hit that mark. And then it's got you know XAPI tools and assessment tools, so it fits into the spy tools category. And then uh, it's very collaborative uh, to work on open source, get all three, learning component, UI community, and then uh, criteria five, accessibility and universal design. Okay, so um, the next project, OER schema that I've been involved with, I worked for a year with an instructional designer, uh, Katrina Ware, and a really good programmer, Alex Boyce, uh, both 
uh, at the time we were working on this project were working at Penn State University. Um, and we sort of had a common issue to solve, so it was sort of just a natural collaboration that ended up happening. And uh, to reiterate earlier when I described what this was, basically it's machine-readable pedagogy tags, express the structured information. So if you go to schema.org, OER schema.org, extend schema.org, and it's this thing that Google made. Basically, you explain to software what things are on the internet. Okay. So we intended to eventually help all published OER become interoperable. We want everyone to use the schema. Um, so right now we'll go around um, telling everyone to use the schema. It hasn't worked yet, but at some point we'll reach critical mass. Two projects currently integrating it into the software. Uh, Elms Learning Network and then Paul Hibbets, uh, who uses a homegrown sort of graph CMS solution for his courses, has also found a way to integrate the schema. Honestly, it's super boring. It should be something you never even have to know about as a faculty member. But right now, the tools aren't there, so I have to tell you about it. Okay, um, so if it describes pedagogy, why didn't we call it pedagogy schema instead of OER schema? Um, if you're an instructional designer, you know that there's all sorts of gojis and that pedagogy is just one kind. There's goji and andagogy. Am I missing any gojis? <laughs> Might be. Um, <clears throat> The other reason is that we want to make open normal, right? We want OER normative emphasis uh, on, the, on the schema. So we want everyone to openly license it. We're biasing production of education materials towards open. As with the OER, we're letting future knowledge workers know that open content is fine. You should do it. And we don't have any interest in proprietary learning design. That's what everyone does anyway. Okay, so in short, OER schema is designed to proliferate remixable OER. That's kind of the whole thing. And if it's not openly licensed, it can't be legally remixed. Some people do care about the law. This uh, diagram shows how uh, I publish to my learning management system. Um, start at gitbook.com, um, which uses markdown format, which is a great standard, easy to learn, markup format, and then I sync that with a central OER source, which in this case is GitHub. You don't have to use GitHub. Um, a lot of people use GitLab. I know Penn State has GitLab and Salt University, so if you want to sort of hide your learning content from the rest of the world, you can do it. And then uh, from there, it gets synced to simultaneous publishing endpoints. So I can simultaneously do an e-publication, a PDF, uh, I don't have a printed book, but it could be used to do a printed book if it's a PDF. Um, and then it also can sort of be sucked into an LMS, CMS, and then it gets published as an HTML5 stack website. And it's those last three where the OER schema opportunity comes in because those are inherently digital formats that are hosted online and web accessible. Those are the best places to try to insert our schema tags. So I have some pictures to show you what this looks like. So here I am at gitbook.com authoring my page. And then in the middle column you can sort of see markup language on the right hand side, the compiled HTML from the, from the markdown. And then when you click the publish button, it syncs it automatically with GitHub, which is super fun. And this is what it looks like in Elms Learning Network, right? So the same page in my LMS. And then this is the same page as the static HTML endpoint, which GitBook actually produces for you. And then uh, here's the ebook. And um, I didn't have a picture of PDF, but I don't know PDF, something like that. Uh, I could do that as well. So what uses the schema right now? If you were so inclined, how could you use schema? Uh, well, you can start using Learning Components, which has OER schema baked in. If you're a web developer and are interested in collaborative user interface design that can span across sort of any application, Learning Components are for you. Um, if you use Gitbook, there's an OER schema plugin that will make the schema work with whatever you are producing in Gitbook. And uh, Paul Hibbis produced a plugin for Graph that will like, layer in OER schema and then you can write it manually. Uh, it's 
not the most enjoyable way to spend your time, but you can do it, which means if you have existing HTML websites on the internet, you can go back and retrofit down the schema. Okay, so we already have powerful digital publishing, as you saw from my YouTube example, and uh, for revolution in technology and education, we need these remix tools. Um, okay, so hashtag robots. Dave Fusco tweeted this uh, recently. I'm gonna read it dramatically. Got my Alexa quiz sending all X API statements, including score, pass fail. Next up, more dudes AI question import. Thanks, some person. Okay, so here are the spy tools. Those are spying, and then uh, this is the robot he uses. We're in the future, and uh, you can play in Dave Musco. And this is the cutest robot I can find on the internet. So I will end it here. Um, but if you want to see any examples of the technology I showed, then we get too much into the weeds. Um, just let me know. Otherwise, are there any questions about anything I showed today? Yes, sir. Uh, with the proprietary uh, old power model, yeah. the incentive is you get paid to, to sure. develop content. What, and, and that's not the only thing that drives academic, especially academic publishing. But um, I guess how, what is the incentive for authors who think they have really good content, not just whatever lecture is but really good content that I put a lot of time in. What's the incentive for me to go through OER? So the question is, what's the incentive to do OER if you know you put a lot of work, and time, and effort into your content? And that's a really good question. Um, so I heard a story once of someone at Penn State who worked for like 20 years to perfect their history slides. And they're super old, which is fine. But one day they will die with their slides, and then no one will have access to the lecture. So what you have is knowledge disappearing. Uh, so I think there's, that's one angle, right? So that's more of the altruistic. You know, we care about preserving knowledge. The other side of it um, is it's not necessarily something you have to do for free. You can get grants. In fact, there are a lot of grants right now to produce OER. Um, I'm going to apply for one soon, actually. Um, so that's one method. The other one is tenure and promotion requirements and language is starting to include OER. I actually took a slide out that uh, had someone from UBC um, talking about uh, how they just added tenure and promotion uh, language about OER. So that's a, another one. Um, also, if you're, it, it really depends on you know, whether you want to make money off your content or if you want to make money off of what you do and what you're known for. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Those are just a few examples I can think of off the top of my head. Yep. I, I guess, are there, if, if I were to publish something in the OER, um, is there a, maybe a common way of, or a standardized way of tracking So the question is how can I um, track the reach and impact of the things that I produce? So the indexing, the OER indexing websites like OER Commons, uh, I think tracks a lot of that. Um, my Gitbook page actually shows me from what countries and how many people have accessed my Gitbook content. Uh, so the tools are really easy to build, and there already are a lot that exist. Um, I'm interested in getting those tools to also work with some of the projects I'm going to be involved with. But um, yeah, I think you can certainly track it. Just a yeah. comment on Kirk's uh, question, because I, I think it, 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 you jump out of education very quickly and go across all kinds of different um, industries. So for the National Center for Forensic Science, 
they're actually located in Orlando. And one of their topics that they've had to deal with is, or they are dealing with, is tracking digital evidence over time so that uh, 30 years from now, 50 years from now, they'll be able to uh, decrypt that evidence and know which what has been altered and what has not been altered. But we're seeing the same thing, the same issues with 3D virtual world authoring, where we have to track every single script, every single image, every single model. Uh, and there's some uh, interesting developments uh, using blockchain to track those transactions going on. And I don't know how that is flowing into the standards organization. Well, the bodies like schema.org who are looking at that, but we really need to get up to the root of the, uh, the data structures and the ontologies that would flow across these uh, industries. Yeah, tracking will also get very interesting once you start modifying and combining content. You know, so who sort of gets credit for authoring that one aspect of the content? And it gets really squirrely when you go international with the different laws and the different interpretations of intellectual property. Yeah, that's a really good point. Anyone else? If you have this, uh, for example, closed source type of content, and your intention is really not to share your content, and is there any tool out there you can use still to, for example, publish in those different formats? PDF, so, EPUB, yeah. Yes. So if you're if you're not into sharing, right. you're test, uh, <laughs> you. So it's really easy to lock that stuff down. Uh, you can pay for uh, private GitHub repos. You can pay for private GitBook um, offering. So free is open right now. And if you want to lock it down, you pay. And um, you can also, if you want to use Git version control for course content, if you want to use Markdown or something, um, you can use GitLab, which is installed for Penn State. Uh, you know, students, staff, and faculty able to actually, I think students can use it as well in certain cases. But uh, yeah, actually, there, it's very easy to, to lock it down. It's effort. Um, it's sort of a, an open effort. So I think um, a large part of how I've been influenced in teaching has actually been influenced from the Drupal community, for instance. Um, so I just. Uh, that help clarify it a little bit? Sure. Okay. Sure. So in our field, especially uh, in IT, we have a, a website like stackoverflow.com, those types of things. So it's mostly like asking or posing a question, and people try to answer a technical, I guess, question. And people get rated, and uh, eventually, I guess, the best uh, answer flows. That kind of thing. So I was just wondering uh, for your open source content if you have any sort of a system that's comprehensive and widely used like that. A uh, system for... To rate the content in the... To, So I don't have anything that, that does content rating. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the stats page, I think that might be... For, for right now, that's an indicator of how many people have found it. I don't really go around telling people about my content yet because um, I'm practicing radical transparency, which means uh, you can see every edit I've ever made, every spelling mistake I've ever made is all in Git version control. So you can go back in time and say, oh, I can't believe it would a sentence like that. But um, I'm waiting until I'm more comfortable with the published quality before I start telling people to go look at it. But you can find it if you want. Um, so, I get an indicator of, well, yeah, I guess it's not really an indicator of quality, but um, OER Commons does have like, a five-star rating system built in. So if you want to access existing platforms that do have that kind of rating system, they do exist. 